In 2015, Alienware released a new lineup of laptops. The Alienware 13, 15, and 17 R2. While those could have rather powerful GPUs for the time, these days they are not nearly as powerful. To better leverage the CPU inside of the laptop, Alienware knew that gamers will always want more power. So, they came up with the Alienware Graphics Amplifier. It essentially was an extra fancy external graphics card dock. Today, we will be reviewing this dock with my RTX 2080 Ti along with overclocking the i7-6820HK. So, as I said in the intro, we will indeed be using this dock with my RTX 2080 Ti and overclocking the CPU at the same time. But first, I need to tell you all a little bit about the dock. The dock has four USB 3.0 ports and, of course, the proprietary dock cable. The cable itself is a combination of PCI Express and regular USB, which is weird. The dock is powered via a regular PC power cable, and the dock cable is very long, which means you don't have to have the dock super close to your laptop. This product has definitely not aged very well when it comes to fitting modern graphics cards. It supports rather long GPUs, but they can't be any taller than two slots, and can't be wider than the PCIe slot itself. While you can install cards bigger than that, the dock won't close, so it won't be easy to transport. The slot itself is wired for PCIe 3.0 by 4. Even though that limits bandwidth significantly, that is still plenty fine for the caliber of CPU you could find in these laptops. The power supply itself can provide 385 watts through dual 8 pins. So it can power pretty hefty cards, even today. Something to note is that when using the dock, you are unable to use the onboard dedicated GPU. Which makes sense, but is still something to keep in mind. Since we are using the dock, I will be connecting it to my main monitor but I am unable to connect my second monitor due to the HDMI port being obstructed due to the casing on the back of the AGA, which is a bit unfortunate. Anyways, enough blabbering. Let's get on to the benchmarks. So we will be using the same benchmark suite as last time, and I will have the 6820HK inside of this laptop Overclock to 4.2 GHz on all cores. Shown on screen now are the previous results that I got with the laptop. Those were pretty good, but these new results are going to be on a whole nother level. Starting with Vivecraft, a VR mod for Minecraft, we definitely see a large performance boost up to 60 FPS with legitimately great performance that I wouldn't complain to have to use all the time. Next up with Elite Dangerous, we see a surprising jump up in the average FPS going up to 78. But oddly enough, the lows are still the same at 31 FPS. Bone Lab ran significantly better here with an average frame rate sticking to 89 FPS and was a far better experience than with the GTX 980M. But it was limited here due to the amount of RAM that this laptop has in terms of graphical settings. Continuing this trend, we have VR Chat, which also ran significantly better than with the onboard GPU again, with 56 FPS on average, with really decent lows and 33 FPS. So clearly with this dock, paired with an appropriate graphics card, this laptop can seriously still kick some butt. Moving on to standard games, we have Crossout, which saw a very nice 185 FPS on average, with lows that are quite a bit down there at 64 FPS. 
Next up, we have Vorian, which saw a very nice increase to 70 FPS just by having that extra 1 GHz of clock speed to play with, and the lows were great as well at 27 FPS. BeamNG ran quite a bit better this time as well with 119 FPS on average, but even though I increased the clock speed by nearly 25%, that is not going to allow me to spawn in more than 4 traffic and 5 parked cars, but I was getting a much better average with that many cars. Rocket League ran so much better than it did last time that I actually am a bit concerned with my results. But no, with 252 FPS on average and lows sticking to 131 FPS, it goes from great performance to completely overkill performance. And last but not least, we have Shadow the Tomb Raider, which, again, got a very nice performance boost up to 112 FPS on average, and the lows also got a nice bump as well. After doing these benchmarks, it's extremely clear to me that this laptop was GPU bottlenecked in nearly every game I tested, which is actually kind of insane when you think about it, given that the onboard dedicated GPU is no slouch. Now that we got all the gaming stuff out of the way, I think it's about time we take a look at how a 1 GHz overclock affects productivity performance. I'm expecting this thing to perform quite a bit better with rendering and video editing now that it is overclocked, but only up to a point. At the end of the day, it is still a quad core. We'll be using the previous three benchmarks so that they can be compared between overclocked versus not to see just how big of a difference you get moving, say, from the 6700HQ to the 6820HK overclocked. On screen, you can see the previous results from the CPU with the stock TDP and boost limits in place. So now that you've seen those, we can head on to the benchmarks. Starting with Cinebench, we see a massive increase to the single core score, which got bumped up to 1,102 points and the multi-core score also saw a massive increase to 4,522 points as well. In the Blender Open Benchmark, we see much of the same results with 76.77 points, which puts it within striking distance of an i5-9400F somehow. And finally, with 3 Mark's CPU Profile Benchmark, we see an all-core score of 3,153 points with 699 points for the single-core score. Now, taking a look at the results, we see quite the performance difference between 3.2 GHz and 4.2 GHz for all the results today. Something I should note is that due to insufficient VRM cooling, the power draw was limited to 67 watts under an all-core sustained load, which results in 3.8 GHz more or less across all cores. However, in games, I never saw it drop below 4.1 to 4.2 GHz, even with supposedly 100% CPU usage. Coming back to video editing, there was a noticeable bump to performance when playing over complex sections of the video and made it much more tolerable versus dealing with the stock performance of the 6820HK. So now that I've finished the, with the benchmarks, it's time to finish the video. So have my opinions of this specific configuration of this laptop changed after this endeavor? They have, I would say. The lack of CPU cores is actually not as big of a deal as I might have expected, and with each of those cores running at 4.2 GHz, well, it's a it actually is pretty dang good for gaming. It has single core performance roughly in line with Zen 2, which is seriously impressive. In fact, in terms of actual overall performance, 
It's rather similar to the Ryzen 3 3100, even though that is a CPU that never really existed. If you have an external graphics card dock with this particular configuration with the 6820HK, then you have a heck of a machine. I'd still retain that a used modern gaming laptop is still better value, given that you can do the same things with newer laptops that you can with this old one. But still, this can still hold up, even today, which is seriously impressive. Well, that's it. If you wonderful people enjoyed today's video, you can show your support by hitting the like and subscribe button, as well as that bell icon, so you never miss another video I upload. I also have a Patreon where you can help me continue making videos like this well into the future. Anyways, DDT, out.